My name is Caroline Castillo Crim, or Carolina Castillo Crim. I was born and raised in Mexico, and uh, I was because of uh, my family's move to Florida first and then Texas, I was able to attend the University of Texas under the magnificent historian Nettie Lee Benson. There is still at the University of Texas a wonderful collection, the Latin American collection. It is called the Nettie Lee Benson collection. And because of Nettie Lee Benson, I became interested in the study of the Spanish and the Mexicans in Texas. And so my first study was with Patricia de la Garza de Leon. And Patricia de la Garza was born sometime around 1770. We're not sure exactly when. And she was from Soto la Marina. And I know that she was from a very good Spanish family because I found the records for her dowry. And in her dowry, she received over 9,000 pesos at the time when pesos really meant something. And in addition to the 9,000 pesos, she actually went on to have ranch animals that when she married, Martin de Leon was uh, her husband. And probably uh, the important part about Martin de Leon is that chances are good that he was probably not of a very high level Spanish family. I know the de Leon family would like to say that he was, but he was a muleteer. And a muleteer is sort of like a truck driver and so for somebody like Patricia de la Garza to marry a truck driver, the reason that she did was because he had become a captain in the militia. And in this case, when you look at the map of Texas, of Tamaulipas and, and southern Texas, what you see is that the area around Soto la Marina was an area that had a tremendous amount of traffic, because of uh, Jose de Escandon. Jose de Escandon had brought in settlers in this region in the 1740s. And so by the 1800s, this was an area that already had settled, very successfully settled, uh, the towns of Mier and Camargo and, and Laredo. And, and so all of these little towns settled because of Jose de Escandon. And he had made sure that Soto la Marina was a port in which you could bring in goods. And one of the reasons that the Mexican government did not like to have uh, the ports other than Veracruz open is because it competed with the merchants in Veracruz. And so when Patricia de la Garza was born in Soto la Marina, chances are good that her family was already involved in uh, the development of the area, uh, certainly in trade. And so when she met young Martin de Leon as a captain of the militia, he was there in order to protect the colonies from the Indian tribes that were going to be raiding from the mountains. Because remember, the whole area of Nuevo Leon and, and Tamaulipas is divided by the, the Sierra Madres. And so the Indians would come down out of the the uh, mountains to raid. And when Martin de Leon had been a, a muleteer, one of the things that we have to remember is that almost 80% of all of the mule trade, all of anything that was carried in the northern, part, northern frontier was carried by muleback. And so Martin de Leon would have had to fight to protect his goods because you have to remember that the goods were, the Indians saw the goods as a Walmart on hooves and so they literally would have enjoyed uh, attacking the mule train if they if they possibly could. So when the two young couple when the young couple got together, he decided. Now he had already been as a muleteer. He had probably already been to New Orleans. New Orleans, remember, was uh, part of the Spanish Empire uh, during the period from 1756 to. Uh, all the way up to 1800. And during that period, Martin de Leon would have been able to go to New Orleans. It was illegal to trade with New Orleans because the merchants, again, in Mexico City and Veracruz, didn't want anybody on the northern frontier trading with New Orleans. That was considered to be very bad practice because it kept the merchants in Mexico City from making a profit. 
And so uh, the De La Garza family then had settled in that region. And uh, so this is, again, what we have with the De La Garza family and the De Leon family, both of them being settlers in this, this northern frontier. And so when we look at the possibilities for them, Martin de Leon having already been probably illegally to New Orleans, but he had carried trade, carried goods on his mules all the way into this northern frontier area, the Tamaulipas region. And so he decided to settle his family in the Aransas Valley area. And so in this case, what we have is on the Nueces River, he finds a crossing. It was called the Santa Margarita Crossing. And that crossing at Santa Margarita is going to be a place where there was traffic coming and going all the time. So Martin de Leon and Patricia settled at the Santa Margarita Crossing on the Nueces River. And it is today, of course, uh, one of the important settlements of South Texas. And uh, so that ranch, the San Patricio Ranch, is going to be one of the ones where Martin and, and Patricia were able to make contact with a lot of different people. And during this period, what we have is that Martin and Patricia begin having children. So Patricia, during the period from 1798 until 1818, has 10 children. And all of those children during this period are going to be part of a very changing and moving uh, culture that is going to take place in Texas during this period. And the reason is because of Mexican independence. Mexican independence takes place in 1810 under Father Hidalgo, and it was part of, triggered by Napoleon. Remember, Napoleon in 1808 had invaded Spain and put his brother, Joseph Bonaparte, on the Spanish throne. And because of that, what we have happening is Mexico itself and San Antonio by this time, which had already been established. San Antonio and the people in San Antonio are going to go up and revolt. And so this is, uh, Chucha is born in 1810, and because of that, uh, the De Leon family had to decide what they were going to do. And what they do is to return from San Antonio. They did a lot of trade with San Antonio because that was where most of the trade came in. And from San Antonio, they went back to their Aransas River Ranch and stayed out of the politics that was going on in San Antonio because San Antonio was in an uproar during this period. Father Hidalgo is captured in 1811 and the Mexican Revolution pretty much declines. Uh, the, the conservatives in Mexico City, the centralists, the royalists, the ones who supported the royal Spanish control were very much opposed to the revolution. And so what happens in 1811 is that San Antonio itself goes up in revolt. And so you have terrible fights between those who were in favor of, of the liberals and those who were in favor of the, the royalists. And uh, Manuel Zambrano is one of the royalists. And of course, Gutierrez de Lara comes to the United States. Gutierrez de Lara is sent from San Antonio to the United States to ask for help. And the United States at the time, remember, is going into the War of 1812 with the British. And so the United States can't help. The United States is, is, supports the idea that Mexico might become a democracy, a liberal democracy. But uh, when Gutierrez de Lara comes back with Augustus McGee and a small army of the North, they're going to try to retake Goliad, and they're going to try to take San Antonio. Unhappily for the uh, revolutionaries, the conservatives in Mexico City sent a very powerful general, General Arredondo, and uh, General Joaquin de Arredondo is going to be sent to the north to put down the revolt. And so when he arrives somewhere south of San Antonio, he meets uh, Gutierrez de Lara's army, Gutierrez de Lara is no longer in control, but Toledo, who is the general, is unable to fight against General Arredondo, who has a, a very successful 
army and a very good uh, control of the area. And so General Agedondo at the Battle of Medina, and we still to this day at Pleasanton, they still have a reenactment of the Battle of Medina. And so this is one of the things that shows that the royalists come back into power. Now, what do the Martin de Leon family do? They stayed on their ranches. They learned to keep their mouths shut and their heads down and stay out of trouble. So Mexican independence actually does not happen in 1810. And this is one of the things that, that confuses people a lot. We, we forget that Mexican independence started in 1810 but the conservatives and the anti-independence people were very much opposed until 1820. And then when the Federalists in Spain, the king himself actually became uh, involved with the Federalists, and when he does, then what happens is that Mexican conservatives, the royalists in, in Mexico, decide they don't want to be part of Spain any longer. And so Mexican independence actually takes place in 1821. And it takes a number of years before the government is able to get established. They first su relatively successfully try under Emperor Agustin de Iturbide. And Agustin de Iturbide is actually just one of the generals, and they raise him to be emperor. And that didn't last very long. And the reason it didn't last was primarily because all of the silver mines that the Mexican government had been counting on to establish this new republic, the Mexican silver mines, the Spaniards who had been run out, took their money with them. And so the mines basically were left with no investment, no money to keep the mines going. The mines began to flood. There was no way to uh, keep them from being destroyed. And so Mexico under Iturbide was unable to continue to prosper. And so what happens in 1824 is that the liberals then begin come into power. And actually, surprisingly enough, it was Agustin de Iturbide who invited the Anglos into, the United, into Texas. The reason he invites the Anglos is because of Joaquin de Arredondo. And Joaquin de Arredondo had killed off so many of the liberals that there was not enough people in Texas to fight against the massive Comanche nation, which was beginning to expand and, and take power, and the Comanches then would raid down into the Spanish areas, down into the Mexican ranches, and they stole horses, they stole cattle, they stole anything they wanted. So the Mexican government learned pretty fast that they needed to accommodate the Comanches. They needed to do something to keep the Comanches happy. So they actually set up a warehouse in San Antonio and allowed the Comanches to come once or twice a year to get whatever goods they wanted. And the Comanches took whatever they felt like. And so the Comanches had become such a powerhouse. There's a wonderful book called Empire of the Summer Moon that talks about the Comanches and the power of the Comanches. But Agustin de Iturbide knew that they needed more settlers. And so he actually talks to a man named Moses Austin. Moses Austin had been a Spanish settler because remember Spanish control had extended all the way up into Illinois. All of the Louisiana territory had been Spanish territory. And so Moses Austin had held a Spanish passport and he actually had mined lead in the Illinois area. And when the lead mines played out, he came down to Texas looking for possible settlement. And uh, when he spoke to the Spanish government, the Spanish government said, yes, you can bring people down. And uh, so they gave him the right to bring in settlers. He goes back to uh, his home in the, Mississippi, in the uh, Missouri area, and unhappily he died that winter, 1821. And uh, when he dies, he writes, uh, his mother writes to Stephen Austin, who was at the time in New Orleans, and says, your father has left you a legacy of taking people, taking settlers to Texas. And Stephen Austin did not want to go. He absolutely was totally opposed to going to Texas. He didn't like the idea, but 
his father had and his mother had said that he would so he does he comes to to San Antonio and uh, he is given a chance to explore the area and they give him the land from the Brazos River to the Colorado and if you take a look at a map it will actually be the area between College Station and Austin all of that land in between, everything from Houston north to College Station to Huntsville practically. And so all of that region was given to Stephen S. F. Austin, but it was not his land. And this is one of the things that we have to be very careful about because he was a land agent. He was given the right to give his settlers land. And this is one of the differences between the Anglo view of land and the Spanish view of land. For the Spanish, the Spanish king was your father, the Spanish government, and later the Mexican government was your father, and your father gave you land. He didn't sell it to you. You didn't buy it from him. You were granted the land. And this is one of the things that just drove uh, poor Stephen Austin absolutely up the wall because he said, please let me sell the land. Let me make a little bit of money. And they said, no, you will get for your trials, for your tribulations, and he did suffer a tremendous amount, poor thing, uh, you will receive as your payment more land. So in other words, for every 100 people, for the first 300 that he brought in, he was to receive five leagues and five labors. Now what the heck is a league and a labor? And why on earth would Americans be willing to come across into Spanish or Mexican Texas? And the reason is, in 1819, the United States government had started selling land for a dollar and a quarter an acre. But you couldn't buy just an acre. You had to buy a section, 640 acres. And very few people except the land speculators had that much money and that much ability to buy the land. And they were happy to turn around and sell the land for $100 for 10 acres. In 1824, when Stephen Austin did come to Texas and began to bring his people, he was offering a league and a labor. A league was 4,428 acres, and that plus 177 acres for your labor. Your labor, we pronounce it labor, not labor, but for your labor, it was your farm. The rest of it was your cattle land. And so it extended from the, the river, because you had to have water for your farm, and so the rest of your land extended in a great big long strip away from the river. And everybody's strips were all along the river. And so when you were suddenly offered almost 5,000 acres for the cost of the paperwork, it's not surprising that 30,000 Anglos began looking very longingly at the possibility of getting land in Texas. And so there were hundreds hundreds and hundreds of people who began to come across the borders into Mexico and settle along the both the empresario area that Stephen Austin had and empresarios from other areas. So Stephen Austin was not the only one. The Mexican government made contracts with these empresarios, these agents that were going to take care of settling the people. Stephen Austin was the only one who really did a good job of settling his people. He was there with them, he took care of them, and his payment, the payment that he received, was more land. But he couldn't sell it because he had to give land to his people. So he was basically poverty-stricken. Martin de Leon is goes on to become one of the empresarios also, and he founds a very small colony called the Victoria Colony, Nuestra Señora de la Guadalupe Victoria. And some people say that it was because of uh, the then president, uh, one of the triumvirate, Guadalupe Victoria, that they called it that, but it later was just shortened to the colony of Victoria. And so Martin de Leon was one of the settlers who establishes a colony. His was a much smaller colony. It was not 
300 or 500 or 1,000 like Stephen Austin's. And so Martin de Leon is then going to be unhappily killed in the cholera epidemic of 1833-34. So during that period then, uh, Patricia de la Garza with her 10 children by this time, by 1834, she has already married off most of her children. And so uh, we have a number of people that are connected now. And that's one of the things that we tend to forget about the Hispanic community is that compadrazgo, the, com the uh, co-parenting of these families is becomes tremendously important. And as you can see from the political divisions, however, is that some of the family were very much in favor of the new American settlers and some of the family was very much opposed to the new American settlers. And so by this 1824, we have, you can imagine what their Christmas dinner was like when suddenly they're bringing the whole family together and not everybody agrees <laughs> with the politics. And uh, so this was one of the difficulties that they ran into. Now, during the Texas Revolution, we do know that some of the family were involved with helping the Americans. And certainly Placido Benavides was a lieutenant for the Texas militia. Jose Maria Jesus Carbajal, who had been married to, into the De Leon family, he was a uh, surveyor and was very much involved in the Anahuac area, or Anahuac, as more properly pronounced. But uh, the Texas Revolution, uh, again, made it hard for the De Leon family to decide, you know, which side they were going to be on. Martin De Leon by this time had already died. And so Patricia de la Garza is now faced with the difficulty of when the Texans finally win and the defeat of Santa Ana at San Jacinto suddenly you have a lot of Americans flooding into Texas. And Patricia de la Garza in Victoria suddenly finds that these new Anglos that are coming in don't realize that she and her family are old Spanish family, that they are the, the, the founders. And uh, a lot of them, these ruffians from the United States begin literally tearing the, the earrings out of the ears of her daughters and, and taking their jewelry. And, and so she asks one of their, one of their settlers, uh, John Lynn, and uh, asks him to take them to New Orleans. And so the family is, it's not that they were exiled, it's that problem with the area is that uh, first you have the Spanish, the Mexican forces jailing her son, Fernando, and then you have the American forces jailing her son, Fernando. And so it was very hard for, for Patricia de la Garza. But once the Americans finally accept Texas, and remember, it took nine years for Texas to be accepted by the United States. And the reason is because it was a slave state. It was an area where Stephen F. Austin had encouraged his settlers to bring their slaves. And so by bringing the slaves in, they had made Texas a slave state or a slave area. And the United States didn't want to upset the balance between the slave states and the free states. By 1845, when uh, the United States finally accepts Texas, the whole state was now going to be under federal control and certainly there was much more settlement. Uh, the judicial system was working. And Patricia de la Garza brought her whole family back to Texas. And when she brought the family back to Texas, some of them settled in Referio, the Andretes, and there are still to this day, they call them Alderites, but uh, a mispronunciation of the Aldrete family. There are still descendants there. Uh, there Felix and Salome de la Garza, who, from whom most of the De Leon families are descended. And there are many, many, many De Leon families all over Texas. And uh, what Patricia de la Garza does as the matriarch, she fights for her land 
Her land had been squatted on by Anglos. Her ranches, she had sold her big ranch, the big uh, Martin de Leon ranch, to a speculator in New Orleans, and so she had the money from that. Some people say that they suffered in poverty, and no, they did not. Uh, they did suffer in Opelousas, where they were settled. They did have family that died. But Patricia de la Garza, when she comes back in 1845, she teaches her daughters and her granddaughters to fight for their land. Yes, they do use land to buy the lawyers that they need, but because of Patricia de la Garza and her, the strength of the Mexican women and the Spanish laws that gave women rights to own things. And this is one of the things that was completely different from the United States. In the Anglo-Saxon world, women were not allowed to own property. In the Spanish world, they not only could own property, but they could also sue and be sued. They could uh, bring cases, court cases, and certainly Patricia de la Garza and her children and grandchildren, all of them learned to fight for their land and got it back, got it back. Mission Valley today is still part of it, is de Leon land. So uh, the whole point of Patricia de la Garza was her success in fighting and keeping her land. So she was tremendously successful. The last will and testament of Patricia de la Garza, and the surprising thing, and we don't know why this is, this is one of those historical mysteries. In her will, Patricia de la Garza leaves her land, her cattle, and her money to her daughters, and to Fernando, her oldest son, she leaves the debts that he has, that he owes to her for the rest of the family to collect from him. Now, why she did that, we don't know. But whatever the case may be, Fernando goes on to, uh, he dies just a few years later, and his wife, Luz Escalera, goes on to develop the, the entire Victoria area with her money and with money from Patricia de la Garza. So Patricia de la Garza proves that the Mexican women were successful. Now, the next woman that we look at is a woman named Petra Vela de Vidal. And Petra Vela, she was, according to her biography, and you will find her biography in many of the Texas history books, she was the wife of Mifflin Kennedy, one of Texas' richest ranchers. She was supposedly the governor's daughter. She was the niece of a bishop. She was supposedly a general's wife, and she became a very wealthy widow. However, when we actually look at the records, what we find is that Petra Vela was not the wealthy widow that we thought she was. Petra Vela was actually not married to Luis Vidal. And this is one of the scandalous things. Lieutenant Luis Vidal, when I found him in the military archives in Mexico City, what I found was that he had gone to military school from 1832 to 1835. He was in Mexico City at the military school. And then his first posting in 1835, and remember that date, 1835 is when Texas is just beginning to declare its independence. And his first posting is to Chiapas. And then from Chiapas, his second posting is going to be to Matamoros. And at Matamoros, he meets a young girl who is a ranching daughter of a rancher. And when Luis Vidal meets this young girl, Petra Vela, she is the daughter of a local rancher. Does she have land in her own name? Absolutely she does. Because remember, Mexican women did have land in their own name. She had her own ranch. And so Luis Vidal, we don't know exactly what happened, but we do know that he retired in 1845, back to Chiapas, and he died in 1850. When I went and looked at the records for Luis Vidal, the second file that the young man at the archives gave me was a file on not Petra Vela, but on 
a woman who was Luis Vidal's wife. Petra Vela had actually been born in Matamoros or somewhere on the river in Mier, we think. And during the American intervention in Mexico, during the American attacks in 1846, 47, and 48, she had had to flee Monterey in order to try to get away from the American troops. But during that time, what we find is that she has a number of children. And the children that she has, the file that I found was not for Petra Vela as Luis Vidal's wife, but the file that I found was for Manuela Andrade y Castellanos. She was a Creole elite. She was the daughter of one of the Chiapas governors. She really was somebody who was very successful. And what we find is that in 1837, Petra Vela had had a son, Luis. In 1838, she had had a son, Vidal. In 1839, she had a daughter, Juana. In 1840, she has a daughter, Luisa. And then suddenly in this other file that I found, I see that Manuela Andrade has a son, Alejandro, in 1840 the same year that Petra Vela has just had a daughter, Luisa. In 1841, Petra Vela has another daughter, Rosa. Manuela Andrade has a son, Joaquin. Rosa is born in September. Joaquin is born in August. What was happening? In 1845, Adrian is born to Petra, and in 1842, I suddenly find that Manuela Andrade marries Luis Vidal. Luis Vidal had never married Petra. Evidently, he was visiting her a lot. And after the marriage to Manuela Andrade, does he quit going to see Petra? No. In 1845, Petra has Adrian, and in 1844, Manuel Andrade has a son, Dionisio. And in 1846, Petra has Vicenta, and in 1847, she has Concepcion. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight children by Luis Vidal. I don't know whether he ever accepted them. According to the baptismal records in Matamoros, these are natural children. They are called hijos naturales. As a friend of mine said, oh, that must mean they were born by natural childbirth. And I said, no, sweetie, that means that they were illegitimate. And so Luis dies in 1850. Did Petra ever find out where he was? I don't know, or what had happened to him, but what's a girl to do? Petra Vela goes to Brownsville in 1850. Remember, Texas has just become part of the United States. Brownsville is a settled community. The Mexican-American War had ended in 1848, two years earlier. And so she goes to Brownsville and meets Mifflin Kennedy. Mifflin Kennedy is a Pennsylvania Quaker who is, had done steamboating for the military, made a lot of money during the Florida Wars and also in Texas for the Mexican-American War. And my question was, he needed a housekeeper. Petra Vela had all these children and no husband, nobody to help her. So did she become his housekeeper? Did she start a little store? We don't know. Did she become a merchant? We're not sure. Whatever the case may be, what happens is that Petra Vela brings her children to Brownsville, but she moves in with Mifflin Kennedy. Her children are not allowed to move in with Mifflin Kennedy. Her Mexican children, Luisa, Rosa, Adrián, Vicenta, and Concepcion, live in a separate house in a different part of the town 
of Matamoros. Meanwhile, in 1852, she has a son by Mifflin Kennedy named Tom. They are not married. Would a Pennsylvania Quaker have been concerned about having a child out of wedlock? Evidently, he was, because two years later, when she becomes pregnant again with James, he marries her in 1854. She goes on to have James in 1855, John Gregory in 1856, Sarah in 1857, William in 1859, and Phoebe in 1860. Petra Vela now has not only her Mexican children, but she has all of these Anglo children as well. However, Adrián Vidal, her son, her last son, she tries to help him. And unhappily, he gets involved in the Civil War in Mexico. First, he joins the Royalists. Then he joins Benito Juárez. Uh, he asks for, during the Confederacy, he joins the Union forces. They offer him all sorts of guns and ammunition and horses and equipment for his soldiers, his buddies, his friends, his drinking buddies. And uh, then in 1863, after joining the Confederacy, he switches to the Union, and then he goes back across the river and joins Benito Juarez in 1864. Adrián Vidal is captured by the French forces, and Petra Vela begs Mifflin Kennedy to save her son, her Mexican son. He is unable to do so. Adrián Vidal is shot by the French. The body is brought back to Matamoros and buried. Kennedy, meanwhile, has made huge amounts of money from the cotton trade. He is, during the Civil War, he's very much involved in taking cotton to the Bahamas, However, he takes the money that he makes, and instead of giving it to the South, he puts it in New York banks. So all of that money from the cotton. And one of the things that he does is to send Petra to Pennsylvania to meet his family. Now you can imagine, in 1861, Phoebe, the youngest daughter, has died, and Petra feeling distraught. Uh, Mifflin feels that if he if she goes to Pennsylvania, now this is during the middle of the Civil War, he sends Petra to Pennsylvania to meet his family, and you can imagine what their tea service was like. And in this case, uh, Petra Vela, when they came back through New York, she says that she would like to have a set of Limoges china. Mifflin Kennedy buys her a complete set for 42 people, and that set today is in Corpus Christi in the museum. Petra Vela then, because of Mifflin Kennedy's success, comes back to Corpus Christi. He builds her a beautiful mansion, but she is unable to help any of her children, her Mexican children. Mifflin Kennedy buys them out for $5,000 a piece. He buys them out at a time when he was a multi, multi-millionaire. And his own children, Tom, James, Sarah, Willie, and Phoebe, all of his children die, and only John Gregory remains. He marries a girl in New Orleans named Marie Stella Turcott. They have two children, John Jr. and Sarita. The town of Sarita in South Texas today is because of the daughter Sarita. In 1885, with no heirs, Petra Vela dies of uterine cancer, and the beautiful home on the bluff overlooking Corpus Christi Bay is sold. But with the money from the Kennedy family, they create the Kennedy Trust and the Kennedy Foundation. Remember Mifflin Kennedy? He was a Quaker. Petra Vela was a Catholic, and that Kennedy Foundation and the Kennedy Trust today is in the hands of the Catholic Church, thanks to Petra. Petra's legacy, she became the Grand Dame of Corpus Christi and South Texas 
She was a friend to the poor, the humble, but under Kennedy's Anglo laws, women had no right of ownership. So her children, her Mexican children, lost out, and the Kennedy family wound up with all of the money from Mifflin Kennedy. The Mexican families today, and there are many of them along the river, who are descendants of the Vidal family, but they are the ones who were bought out by the Anglos and left with nothing. The power of Mexican laws that gave women the rights to land, the women's women the right to homestead, the women the right to sue and be sued and to conduct business in their own name. Patricia de la Garza was able to continue her family's legacy and the de Leon family exists today because of Patricia de la Garza. The Vidal family today exists, but they don't have the wealth that the Kennedy Trust does. Thank you.